and Tess uh, for taking the time to share some of these less travel, traveled basic routes. Uh, quickly before we get started into the presentations, uh, I just want to let everyone know, so those of you that have come to Pass Beta and Brews, uh, we've done the Q&A through our kind of chat feature. Uh, this time we're going to do something different. We're going to use the raise your hand feature. So on here to raise your hand, um, you, got, you should see manage participants, like a toolbar on your Zoom, uh, and there'll be a button that says raise hand. Uh, when you click that, it'll appear uh, in the participants list, and then Sky um, will recognize you after all the presenters are done, and we'll just, uh, you can ask questions in order that way. That way you can turn on your screen, uh, you don't have to type it out. I think it'll make it a lot more kind of personal and uh, it's nice to see people too, to ask those questions. All right, uh, quickly, I know we get a lot of people that aren't necessarily uh, associated with the Mountaineers, especially with virtual events like this. Uh, just a quick overview of the Mountaineers. Uh, so we were founded, founded in 1906. Uh, we are a 501c3 uh, nonprofit with the mission to provide outdoor education, recreation, and conservation opportunities. Uh, with the COVID-19 outbreak, like many businesses, organizations, and nonprofits around the country and world, uh, we've taken a particular hit. Uh, we've had to uh, do standby for staff and close and cancel many, many uh, courses, activities, and our buildings uh, during this time. Uh, so if you enjoy this event or any other events we've been doing lately uh, and you feel in your heart you want to do a, or give a gift, uh, please check out mountaineers.org slash donate. Uh, and please remember to just list if uh, this was an event that kind of inspired you and helps us kind of track that information. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about uh, Snowfield Peak uh, that's in the North Cascades National Park. Uh, so Snowfield Peak is a two to three day glacier climb, depending on how much you want to break it up. Uh, it's low fifth class scrambling on the summit block. Uh, round trips, roughly about 16 miles with 7,500 feet of elevation gain. Uh, from my research, I, I, on the Mountaineers, it says you can climb it from uh, June all the way through September. Uh, from people I've chatted with and looked at like trip reports, most of the successful summits are occurring uh, late June, mid-July. Uh, I know last year we had a group that went two weeks before us and the summit was still covered in snow. And I know when we went on the scramble uh, in mid-July, I definitely wouldn't want to be on some of those steeper parts on the snowy areas. Uh, additionally, the backcountry, camp, uh, backcountry camping permit is required. It's limited to six people in that area, but it's really not that competitive, it turns out. Uh, when we went to get our permit, uh, we were, I think, like 13th in line, and uh, we still got a permit, no problem. And we only saw one other group up there, and they were doing car to car that day. So it was a really, it's a, such a beautiful climb. It's really accessible, actually, as far as uh, getting into the National Park and parking, uh, and, but it still feels really isolated and beautiful up there. All right, so overview. Uh, getting into Snowfield, as easy as driving, you see right here, the entrance, North Cascades, uh, coming from the west. Uh, just drive up, go past Gorge Lake. Before you get to Diablo Lake, there's a turnoff uh, for Pyramid Lake uh, trailhead. And that's where you start uh, your climb and day. A uh, quick overview here. So uh, the first base camp is actually right up here. Uh, and then there's another second bivy spot. I'll go into more detail on those later. Uh, and there's also, so in theory, a camping spot here, more early season. I camped there in 2017 when we tried to do this in May. Uh, it, it was very thick snow. I wouldn't recommend it. And we turned back because we just watched avalanches come down this gully most of the afternoon. All right, zooming in a little bit more. Uh, so this climb has a little bit of everything, uh, especially a lot of bushwhacking uh, once you get past Pyramid Lake. The green line here uh, is courtesy of Brian Starlin. Uh, I don't have my track on here, but it's pretty much the same except for a couple tips that he gave me uh, to not to do and our team to not do. Um, so the beginning you're just right here on Pyramid Lake Trail, easy peasy trail, uh, well cleared, well maintained. But once you get past Pyramid Lake here, it takes about an hour for most teams. 
that's where it turns into uh, a lot of steep uh, climbers trails, a little bushwhacking, uh, literally like gra grabbing onto roots to get up some escarpments to get up there. Uh, but there's plenty of break spots, plenty of beautiful views along the way uh, to get up to that point. Uh, idea of, so this is a quick picture of some of the stuff we're encountering, thick woods, uh, ambiguous trails, things like that. Um, so it makes for a, a pretty fun time. Uh, then as you get up to more of the clearing, uh, you have a couple options that we did, found during research. Uh, one option is you can actually uh, drop down into this gully. Apparently there's a climber's trail down there. Uh, we decided not to do that because we weren't keen on uh, regaining the elevation. And as I mentioned, those, the other party we saw that did car to car that day actually took this route. And they said it was actually pretty, pretty darn sketchy to get up and down. Uh, so we decided to go around uh, this kind of large uh, bulge here. And it was mostly boulder fields, pretty easy. Maybe added a little time, but it, it made for a much faster uh, travel around time. Uh, quickly, so what I'm gonna do is see a, a series of pictures here. I have this arrow, arrow shows where the photographer is and where we're looking. So right now we're about to go around the back of this big, uh, uh, large, like larger hill. Uh, and then we're eventually going to traverse around along this uh, kind of what's left of this snow field uh, to the campsite up there, which is right here on this map. Then after we moved around uh, that uh, little mountain there, uh, here's the traverse. Uh, we spaced it out because there was a risk of rockfall and there was uh, running water here. So we had a bit of a snow bridge and we wanted to reduce the weight on that. So that was the decision we made. Uh, to cross that point. Then next, so after we crossed that uh, little bit of uh, escarpment there in snow, uh, to get up to your first base camp, uh, we had a little trouble finding it. You actually come in uh, along this frozen kind of glacial melt out, and then you scramble up uh, this hill. And they're actually really beautiful sites. They are there's about, so we had one, two, three, four tents there. Uh, there are several sites, but some of them you see were flooded out. And uh, we actually had to build this. This was a pile of rocks and we rebuilt uh, this uh, windbreak here. Uh, so we spent the night there. Then the next day uh, for the summit day, we have our first glacier crossing. Uh, we go across uh, pretty much another boulder field and then enter this, uh, this glacier. I think this was Colonial Glacier, if I remember. Uh, we roped up for this. The group two weeks before us did not. They didn't see any open crevasses, didn't think it was enough risk for them. Uh, we did have some crevasses right here, very small, uh, really didn't have any trouble as far as navigating uh, around that type of stuff. Uh, the first thing that uh, we pretty much learned from Brian too was uh, don't turn too early when you're coming up that hill. So this was, was camp here. We came across, and you see this two band of rocks right here. The trick is to turn just at the right time, not too late, so you end up here, and not too early, so you're scrambling across any rocks so with your crampons, it's like that. Um, so just a quick note to get uh, hit that gap right there. Really wasn't too steep. We didn't put any pickets. Um, Maybe we just cruise pretty much up it to get to this uh, this first pass this pass up here. A uh, quick note that there's a bivy site about the size for about two small tents. So there's a lot of other peaks up there that you can tag. And that wouldn't be a bad spot um, to set up another base camp. There is running water when we were there coming down from this other peak. All right. So then. Once you get to this uh, pass, then we're looking out. So we get our, actually our finally our first site of uh, Snowfield Peak up here. Uh, we drop down uh, onto the Neve Glacier. Uh, and dropping down, we also have a couple options. Uh, Brian, I think this satellite image is not the same time, obviously, but uh, we found it, it was pretty rocky. So we came down here and it was still snow covered. That's what you see here. And we did put uh, a, quite a, a row of pickets to get down. It was actually pretty darn steep. Um, from the picture, it doesn't look that steep, but uh, I'm stepping backwards and plunge stepping or kick stepping in uh, with the team to get down that. 
Uh, and that's the only time we put pickets in for crossing. Uh, and then across the Neve Glacier, this is a big overview. So we were right about there. Got this big crossing here before we get the Snowfield Peak. As soon as we drop down in, uh, ping pong ball, we are completely socked in, uh, completely following just our GPS and using our navigation skills. But then as we came back up, it was like the most beautiful like morning kind of moment where you get up above those clouds, you get to see your objective um, and see all the other peaks of North Cas Cascades right around you. Uh, so that is our, first, our, our site of uh, Snowfield Peak there coming on the approach. We come up here to the right and then we eventually walk up this ridge line and we, uh, I'll go in more detail, but we uh, flanked kind of the left side, uh, climbers left, uh, to get up to the summit. There is a second option uh, and I'll show you that in a sec. So they're just coming through here up to the base. Here's us coming up that ridge line. We dumped all our glacier gear here. Uh, we did all keep our packs because it was uh, pretty chilly. We wanted to keep our food and I have uh, climbing gear with me, a trad rack, uh, and things like that. But we did keep our packs uh, with us, but we dropped like our ice axes and stuff away. Uh, so coming up that ridge line there, that's where we dropped our gear. Uh, there's beta on mainly what I saw two possibilities that come up. Uh, what trips up a lot of people, I think, on this peak, who I've read and talked to other people, is finding this route off the left side, because there is a really obvious goalie going right up here. Uh, it ends and it just kind of drops off into this uh, steeper section. Uh, and then this is kind of a, a vague climber's trail, which is probably covered in snow most of the time. Uh, but so we came up this way, kind of hit a dead end, came around trying to find it in different ways, eventually scrambled back down and kind of found this uh, belay station and then scrambled our way up, just setting a hand line here. Uh, then the option two is dro actually dropping down that gully uh, and then scrambling back up it to get the snowfield peak. And we went kind of for option three, where we came around, summited, scrambled down, and then came back up that uh, goalie part to get back out. Uh, so here's a picture of what that looks like. These are both the same, pretty much the same pictures. This is the same as this. Uh, that's that same point. So this option one, this belay station, is what I'm talking about right here. And that belay station is it's just tons of room. So you can set up a hand line. I put like one piece in. It was pretty low, uh, uh, like grade as far as getting up. And we had all six people at this belay station just anchored in. And then it's an easy traverse, a kind of an airy traverse here that you come across to get to the summit block. So then uh, after we hit the summit, then we went down the deep gully and then it's kind of scrambled up this. I put a hand line in there, uh, but most of the students didn't even, they didn't, even they didn't touch it. They, it was such a blocky climb. They were fine with it. Uh, but it, it definitely looked a lot more sketchy from above looking down uh, to get to it. And that's why we didn't go around that. Uh, okay, I think that's it. Oh, just a quick summary. Hopefully I'm on time here. Yep. Uh, Really pretty standard gear, basic overnight gear as far as getting up there, standard glacier gear with your rescue stuff. Um, we had two teams of three. Uh, one had a 30 meter glacier rope. Uh, the other team had a 60 meter full strength rope. We just took that one 60 meter up with us uh, on the scramble. And the rack that I brought was uh, pretty, pretty tiny. So 0.3 to the two, uh, I think I put the a 0.75 on the scramble and then use the rest for anchoring. Um, and then, yeah, only hand lines and no repels on it. Uh, as far as timing, uh, I felt like we were, we were a very strong group, but then when I looked at the times, we were, as far as the website, we were on the, the much later side uh, of the, the timing of it. Uh, so we, just doing the quick math here, so I'm at the trailhead about 9 a.m. Uh, so that took us six and a half hours to get to upper camp, you know, and we took our time. We took breaks when we needed to, and it is a lot of elevation gain. Uh, and then the second day, 
Uh, it took us seven hours to get to the summit. I think that had a lot to do with route finding once we got to the summit block. Uh, and then also the time it takes to like rope up and then you know set pickets and all those types of things. Because we were right at our turnaround time. Um, call out to one of our, one of the people on our climb that has, has stopwatch keeping us like on time to make sure, all right, five minute break, then we'll keep going. We keep it on time with it. Uh, return to upper camp and then rest at the camp, break it down and then head it out 7.30. Uh, key part of that, if you have the time and you wanna take three days to do it, definitely think about it because that was an awful drive home back to Seattle for us at 7.30 after that long day uh, to head out. Um, and there's, I didn't go into more detail because of time, but there's tons of other peaks up there to tag and have a good time up in that beautiful area. Okay, and if you want more details, check out the full trip report that I wrote and pulled from other people's uh, generous contributions uh, on mountaineers.org. Cool. Beyond, it's all yours. Okay, let me just share my screen. And you should see my presentation now. Got to get some feedback if that is true? Yeah, we can see it. All right. Okay, sweet. All right, cool. So Mount Baker might not be the mountain you might want to connect with less traveled basic routes. Maybe with basic routes, but certainly not with less traveled routes. But there are some routes to Mount Baker where you might not see anybody for the entire weekend, and Boulder Glacier is certainly one of them. Just to get a quick overview of where we are. Uh, so this is a view kind of from the south east that I happen to see on a flight home. So you see in blue here that's the eastern glacier, in green the Coleman glacier, the north ridge comes up here in the back in yellow, and the, Coleman, uh, the boulder glacier is over here. Looking at that on a map, roughly the same orientation, uh, we got the standard routes eastern and glacier. Eastern and Coleman here on the left. And as you see here, uh, the Boulder Glacier route is pretty much a straight shot, almost a straight line from the trailhead to the summit with a few uh, variations. Um, we start pretty low, 2,700 feet, and that certainly has an impact on how strenuous the climb is. But before we get to the trailhead, there is a road. And don't do that what I did. Uh, that is the last picture I had of my car that I totaled on the way home by running into a big bump uh, on the way down. So the last 4.2 miles of the road uh, are pretty rough. I made it once with my sit down uh, on that road. The second time it was dark and I hit a big bump and uh, the oil pan was gone. So be cautious, you can do it, but just be cautious when you take a standard car. Uh, also note that um, AAA doesn't serve forest service roads, even though the towing truck that I used here was a member of AAA. And there is no cell phone contact on the road. Made for a very long night on that road. But going up to the climb. So we manage the road, uh, are at the trailhead and it's pretty good trail up to here to that decision point. Uh, this decision point here, it's where you cross a creek, you have two options. You can take the wet option, that is a wet trail, a bog and uh, a fourth class, sometimes wet scramble, or you can take a very classic bushwhack with uh, second class scramble up to a ridge. And let me show you a couple of the, what these options look like. So let's do, first start with that wet trail. Well, this is what a wet trail looks like. It's pretty muddy once you pull the feet, uh, the shoes off of your feet. The bog here, if you're lucky, it's covered in snow, but it can be very boggy as well. And here, courtesy of Sky and Sari, a picture of the scramble uh, that you might see. And next to that white line, that's a fixed line of unknown quality that seems to be permanently installed there. I've never climbed up that little scramble. I've only repelled it down, so I can't really say how the climb would be. Every time I've been there, which has been twice, 
uh, in June 2017 and 2018, uh, that route has been pretty wet. But I've also heard from others that uh, it can be a pretty decent scramble. The other route is a bushwhack that doesn't want to pull the, the shoes off your feet, but wants to pull everything from your pack. So here, there's a low point where you cross the creek, you head up to uh, this saddle point. That's an awful a bushwhack. And then you think you're done, but no, you're not done. You scramble your bushwhack for quite a while further, pretty much staying here on the ridge. You will reach, here you see a view of that ridge. And if you're lucky, you have nice weather, you can see the summit from there. You aim for this little high point on the ridge. And here in the lower picture, I'm showing uh, a scramble that goes to the back of this. It's a short second class scramble to the back of this boulder. At times it must be harder because we've seen some wrap rings installed here at the top. So once you get out of the woods, uh, uh, you, you're out in the snow and if you're lucky, you have a gorgeous view of your summit. Um, and what you see here is sort of, this is the outline of the route. You go up here for the first day and the here is in red, you see the summit day. What is also clear here is that you actually very little on the boulder glacier. The boulder glacier, best to my knowledge, is what I marked here. While most of the road, the route stays to the right of this cleaver, to the north of this cleaver, and actually only touches the boulder glacier here at the very top. Another thing you see here is that there are no, no other climbers. So the first weekend that we climbed it, we only saw two rangers skiing down and nobody else. So this is really unique on Mount Baker that you have really solitude there. So regarding camp, you still have two options or you again have two options. You can either stay here at a lower camp, roughly where uh, that blue line ends. Uh, it's at 5,700, oops, sorry. About 5,700 feet plus is, it's lower, it has running water, you might be able to camp on dry ground and you don't need to be on a glacier on day one. The second camp is a bit higher, it's about 7,500 feet, it's obviously higher, it has no running water and you need to rope up on the first day, but it makes for a shorter summit day. Some pictures from the different camp options. Uh, down here, I'm standing here at the lower camp. You got a nice little puddle where you get uh, running water. You got a wonderful view of Mount Jackson. Uh, the higher camp here is at the end of the lower end of that cleaver. The cleaver ends in this really weird uh, rock outcropping. And again, you have a very, very nice view on Mount Jackson. And that's really one of the highlights of this climb. The views of Mount Jackson, the views of Mount Baker, especially early in the morning, are absolutely gorgeous. So then comes summit day. Um, the first part of summit day shown here on the red line, you stay on top of this cleaver. That's mostly fairly straightforward, uh, almost like a snowfield. Got a little bit of a decision to make here. And then the biggest decision is up here at around 9,000, 9,500 or 9,000 feet where you have two options. And I will go into that in separate slides. So uh, that's the view at about 9,000 feet. Let's first talk about the, the Bergschrund, Bergschrund option, Bergschrund. Um, so you are here at this fairly flat place where it really invites you to take a break. And then you get in this kind of awful area with a bunch of uh, smaller crevasses. Uh, we actually had one of our students on a second climb stepping into a crevasse and dangling with his feet in, in free air. So that was a, a little bit unnerving. And you see actually down here, there's a big crevasse just below that. I will show that a little bit later. So if you take the workshop option, you follow the red line, make it through these little crevasses here, end run a really big crevasse, and then head for, for the Bergschrund that I'm showing here in a, in a blow up picture. It's a bit fuzzy because it was part of a much bigger picture, but you roughly see here might be able to make up our trail and it crosses over here. And that's a bit of a bottleneck. Um, that Bergschrund tends to uh, melt out fairly early in the season. And when that is out, that route really isn't an option anymore. From there on, it's a pretty quick ascent to the summit. Picture of that Bergschrund in 2017. Uh, it was a pretty straightforward crossing, uh, really nothing much. But I think a couple of weeks later, it didn't go anymore. 
Looking down from almost at the summit, looking down the, the Bergschrund route here, you see it's a pretty straight shot and you see that long uh, snowfield glacier that you first follow. Going back to the place that I showed earlier, uh, about 9,000 feet, that was our second trip. Uh, Group is excited to go higher up here. So that solid line is the first option. The second option is here. Uh, going to the left into this bowl. Uh, the first thing that we encounter there is a bit of a traverse. We had just gone through an area with a, with a number of crevasses and then the big crevasse that I showed you before was just below us. So that's an area where we were, or where Constanza, who was the rope lead, was a bit cautious and put in some pickets. Makes for pretty cool views. There are some really big crevasses uh, right next to your trail. And unfortunately also one that wasn't so comfortable to cross, that was a snow bridge that was sort of on its uh, way out. I think a week later, uh, that route wasn't good anymore. After you really haven't seen anybody all day, uh, you're surrounded by people on the summit, which makes it kind of cool to, uh, you sort of enter from the backside to the summit and then disappear through the back door again. Uh, and then comes when you return back from the summit, a long descent, uh, have to make sure that the snow bridges haven't melted out. Uh, you can see the entire route going down here, uh, down to the cleaver, and you can see uh, Baker Lake here at the bottom. The descent, uh, there are two options again that you can take uh, here in the middle section. It's about 8,500 feet or so. Uh, in red here is the route that we took on the way down, which is a bit of a sloppy descent. The snow got very soft. Um, sometimes the, uh, the bedrock would come through, so it wasn't the most comfortable one, but eventually we made it, oops, made it home okay. On the ascent, we actually uh, stayed a bit further right. Uh, that seemed a little bit better at the time. So again, you have a few options. On our second climb, uh, it was good to watch the weather, kind of a cool picture here. Uh, that night there was an enormous thunderstorm that went down when I was waiting in my car for AAA uh, to, to pick me up. So some final thoughts on that climb, why should you go? It's a really remote route on Mount Baker and it really feels like it's a bit of an adventure. You don't follow a boot track really, uh, you, you find your own trail. The views of Mount Baker and Mount Shuxon, I hopefully I've conveyed that, are really, really beautiful. And the, the sunrise with Mount Shuxon in the background is, is, is absolutely stunning. What is to consider, it's, it's certainly a strenuous route. Uh, you gain about 8,100 feet, including a bit of a bushwhack. Uh, and I'm listing here the numbers where the starting points for Boulder, Easton and Coleman are. So you almost have to gain a bit more than a thousand feet more than on the standard Coleman route. There certainly are some challenging sections, so for a student it shouldn't be the very first glacier climb. And you should go early season, which is uh, the June area. Uh, there are some crosses at 9,000, 9,500 feet and the Berkshire that uh, could block your way. Uh, you got a bunch of choices on the uphill. I personally recommend, uh, there might be different opinions out there, to do the bushwhack on the way up, the bushwhack and the ridge on the way up, and then uh, do the bog and hunt line uh, descent. Uh, on that section, I recommend to repel. We have seen some groups, in, one group that was ahead of us that tried to down climb and that just took really forever, made us wait for a couple of hours until that group was through. Uh, the two options that you have for camp, uh, out of the two trips, the lower camp might, was my favorite because it just seemed to be a little bit more comfortable camp and having running water certainly is not, not a bad thing. Be aware that it ha can be windy. Uh, we lost one tent during the first trip and we almost lost another tent during the second trip. And most importantly, have fun. And I want to close with that beautiful view of Shuxon and the sunrise. Okay. Handing it off to Stephen. Hello, everyone. Let me uh, share screen here. Uh, 
All right. Okay, so I'm going to talk about Tupson and DeVore. Um, a brief introduction. I'm not sure. I'm sure that a lot of folks don't don't know me. I am uh, with the Everett branch. I've been a climb leader since 2008 or 2009. Um, I quickly did all of the standard routes, some of them two or three times, and then I kind of got bored with doing standard routes, so I branched out to um, off the beaten path routes and also been pursuing bulgers, and I'm at 98 out of 100 right now. So <clears throat> there's some motivation for including this route. Um, I actually, I believe I actually created the description in the Mountaineers website. I've done several of those. And um, a, a basic student was a, um, a guinea pig for this route, as were two new leaders. Um, it actually worked out well. And um, like this route is located um, near Stahican, um, north, north side of Lake Chelan. Um, and like any, any routes that you do for approaching from that side, whether you're doing Bonanza or you're, you're doing uh, Logan or Goody from, from that side, um, there are the logistics of taking uh, the boat up lake and um, you know, coordinating that with um, your return and taking a bus from Stahican to wherever you need to go. Um, so I got a quick summary of that. Um, I've done this several times, whether it was the Holden or Stahican. Um, I found it best actually just to to go up lake from uh, a field to point landing. It's a shorter drive. Um, unless unless you're planning to take a plane back or a plane one away or, 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 you know, take a dog up or something like that, there's, there's really no need to um, take the, the Chelan from Chelan. It's just a longer, um, a longer boat ride. Um, so up lake, I've gone about at the uh, the 920 boat, which is the, the express boat. Down lake, you can actually take um, the express or the slow boat. You just need to plan your trip and when you um, are hoping to be back to get your bus ride back to Stahican and whether you want to take the early morning or I guess it's afternoon to 12 o'clock or the 145 boat out. There is a difference in fare and actually you can um, you can actually hedge your bets and pay less money and plan to come out later. But if you end up getting back to Steakin earlier, um, you can just pay the extra money if they have room on the boat. And um, they've, they, so you have to check the times. I do have links in the slide deck um, because the, the seasons do change. I think it's June 6th is the inflection point here for high, high season uh, when they're running the bus like in perfect coordination every day with, uh, with the boats. Um, but typically as the boat arrives, you have 30 minutes to do whatever you need to do. And then there's the red bus that'll take you um, as far as you need to go. And in this case, it's going to be to Harlequin Bridge, $8 each way. So once you get that logistics out of the way, um, oh, and um, I included this, these links for, um, you know, for if, if I share this out. Um, I used a combination of uh, Summit Routes, the the well-known book from every from Stevenson and Bon Giovanni. I also uh, um, did some research using Summit Post, uh, the East Face route by Klenke, of course Cal Topo, and um, also beta from folks. Uh, Sean Albert and Noel Howe had done this route the, the previous year and I got some good beta from them as well. Uh, as far as the technical aspects, um, you can make this a, it, it's at minimum a three-day climb. You're going to spend a full day approaching because of catching the boat, riding up lake, catching a bus, and getting the trail. It's already noon. And uh, the approach is to Bird Creek is, is uh, it's about 4,000, 3,000 foot gain. And then if you go up to a higher camp, it's at least 4,000, 4,200, something like that. Um, so that's, that's a full day. And then you got a full climbing day and then a full day, to, a, a shorter day to get out. Um, if you, if you're a fast party and uh, you um, are, are very efficient, especially if it's a little bit earlier season and there's more daylight hours, you can get Tups and Endivore in one day. If you want to make it more comfortable, it'd be four days to get both of them. Uh, Tupson itself, 
Um, it's listed in the summit post route description as five to six pitches. So he, he, he lists it out as P0 to P5. It's actually a three-pitch climb. Um, there is a fourth-class pitch that has um, an option of doing like a short 5-2, five, 5 easy uh, move or two. And then there are two pitches that actually have um, a couple fifth-class moves in them. Everything else is, you know, move the belay, scramble third-class terrain kind of deal. If you had somebody that was sketched or uncomfortable, you can always um, set up a hand line. But um, it's really a three-pitch climb. Devore is mostly class two to three, a lot of off-trail travel. Um, as you get very close to the summit block, there is one exposed fourth class move around a corner, and then there is one short fourth class uh, face section that is unprotectable, I'd say 20 to 30 feet. So you, you want a, comf a leader comfortable doing that that can just bring up the rope and then set up a top line. Um, so here's a map showing the in, entire approach and route. Um, the boat drops you off somewhere to the right of the stash line here. And <clears throat> the bus option um, will take you up to Harlequin Bridge, which is right here where I've got the yellow line starting. And um, you pick up this uh, Company Creek Trail. Uh, actually, you, you just walk towards the airport, the airfield, the airstrip, whatever. And um, you kind of uh, just skirt around it and find uh, the Devore Creek, or sorry, the Company Creek Trail, and then the Stahican River Trail. And you follow the Stahican uh, River Trail about three, it says 3.3 miles, back where you're to Weaver Creek Campground, which is directly across from where you got off the boat. So it's, it's kind of frustrating in that you take a bus to take you far away from where you want to go, just so you can cross the river on a nice bridge and then walk back. Um, I've heard rumors that you can find locals that'll take you across here. Uh, I never managed to figure out how to do that. I've been up here three times. Uh, I guess you could bring a kayak or something. It's like a quarter mile or half a mile or something across the water here. Be pretty simple and you could dock your, your boats there if you wanted. Um, but we're talking like an hour, hour and 15 minutes anyway of walking. Um, and that's all flat. It's mostly flat, just a little bit up and down. <clears throat> At that point, um, you start heading up the Devore Creek Trail, and um, uh, this trail actually, um, two years ago when I did this, uh, the PCT had rerouted here, and they had really cleaned it up and cut all the brush back, and it was pretty nice. Um, I went back last year, and it was starting to grow back in, but it was, it was still a pretty nice trail. Um, there's some quick switchbacks up in this section here. Gain a lot of elevation quickly, 1,000, 1,500 feet or so. And then um, that's just because on this side here, there's a gorge with waterfall in it. Once you get above that, it's, it's pretty uh, mellow grade. It just follows along Devore Creek. You're above it, um, varying elevations, and you just keep working your way up until an obvious camp. There's only one camp. It's Bird Creek Camp. And um, it's... Um, not the, the most glorious camp. I'll show a picture of that. Um, that camp would be fine if you just want to do either Tupson or Devore. Uh, day two, you could go up, do Tupson, come back down, camp there again, and then hike out on day three. Um, I would recommend the higher camp if you're worried about, if you have, if you have time still, you get up there still decently early. And um, especially if you want to try to get if you're going to get Tupson and Endivore, even if it's not in one day, because you don't want to like go up and down this 1,200, 1,400 feet twice. It's all off trail. Um, at this point, what you're doing is you basically keep Bird Creek as a hand line on your left, and you follow the path of least resistance and avoid as much bushwhacking as you can. Um, the farther you stay to the right, the steeper the train is. It's a little tougher, but if you go too close to the creek, you're going to hit brush. Um, it's only 1,200 feet, and you can see on this map, it is a, not that much uh, horizontal distance. All right, so let's see here. Uh, this is more of a, um, a zoom in. <clears throat> so um, there's actually um, two areas in here where you can camp. The, the first one you encounter when you start getting to flat areas 
a flatter area in here, maybe 5,400 feet, 5,350, somewhere in there. Um, it's really nice. It's just in a wooded area with, with water right by you. Um, and plenty of like nice flat areas, dirt, where you can set up a bivvies or two person tents really easily. Um, if you want to, if you want to try and tag both peaks in a day, you, you want to go two or 300 feet higher. And in that area, it's more like bivy. You got to just, you know, squeeze out a spot. And that's where I got this triangle, uh, marking that camp. Um, the approach, uh, from that point for Tupson is essentially just finding a path of least resistance up the hill to your right. Um, as you can see from these contour lines, there's just this broad kind of ridge, just like shoulder here. And um, you just work in your way up until you crest that ridge. And at that point, you're gonna see the classic pictures, which I'll show you uh, of Tupson. Um, you basically kind of traverse a basin and get to the base of the route, and then you do the, the climbing route. For Devore, um, I just sniffed away up a gully here. Um, I'm not sure if I've even drawn the correct one, if it's that one or if it was this one, or if it's that one or that one. Um, standing in this spot, I didn't like the look of the cliff bands up in here, so I didn't go any farther. I, I just went straight up this, this section here, one of these. Um, at that point, you come to this nice shoulder with it's very flat, just beautiful lakes and just gorgeous views to uh, over to White Goat Mountain and Tupson and you see bonanza everything from from that flat area you just um have to work your way up to this call here and then you just follow the ridge basically and there's one spot that's a little tricky um, i think they're showing it on here there's still as a snow field i did this climb in september and that snow field uh was was ice it was pretty bad and all the route descriptions said, don't go left, don't go around the south, the south side, stay on the north side. And I wasted over an hour trying to find a way safely up the snow, the ice, to an obvious, there's two or three calls up there in the rock. And eventually I just said, screw this, it's not going to work. And I just went around the back and it was fine. It was a little bit exposed in a spot or two, but it's just a class retraverse around the back. And then you kind of work your way up to the summit ridge. Okay, so now for pictures here. Uh, get this here. All right. Um, so this is uh, riding up lake towards the Hecan. <clears throat> I believe this peak here is either uh, Castle or it's um, Flora. So the, that's just getting in the vicinity of, of Tupson and Devore. They're, they're not visible from the lake. You're not going to see them. Um, they're kind of like off to the right and behind here. Um, so this is a picture of showing like um, basically as you're ascending those steep switchbacks from Weaver Point. Uh, Weaver Point campground is down in here somewhere. The, the boat drops you off down in here and you, you take the, the bus, the red bus on this side of the lake, way out of frame on the left. And then you hike that 3.3 miles out of frame on the left into here. And then you start the switchbacks up. On the right is the gorge with the waterfall that I was mentioning. It's a beautiful waterfall. Um, very pleasant as even on a hot day, as you're coming up out of that out of the, the lake area, the basin, it starts to get a nice breeze and it's just really nice in here. Um, I always take the picture of the, the wilderness sign for some reason. This is pretty indicative of what most of the trail looks like. It's a, a lot of traversing and just a reasonable trail. It's not too eroded, it's not too rocky, it's just a, a reasonable trail. And uh, you do this for about four miles to Bird Creek Camp. <clears throat> this is from the Summit Post um, uh, picture. So I think Clanky or someone put this up. Um, it's not the most glorious camp, but if you're tired and it's getting late and you wanna just stop there, it's, it's a fine camp. It's got running water right by it. Otherwise you move the camp a little bit higher, as I was mentioning. 
Uh, this is the view that you get um, after you crest, um, you crest that ridge I was telling you. Um, and this is, this is Tupson right here. I, as I mentioned, I did this in late September. So there was a lot of rock boulder hopping and traversing uh, various size rocks. If you do this late June, mid to mid July, most of this is snow or more than half of it. It's probably very easy going. I just did this route late season because it was um, like a bonus trip at the end of the year. The route actually starts kind of up in here and there's a ramp that leads to the right. And then from there, you just kind of sniff your way up. I will show the, uh, the topo from, from Summit Post. <clears throat> so like I mentioned, he, he puts it in six pitches, but <clears throat> I'll quickly go through them here. I'm kind of of the philosophy of um, not trying to read uh, pitch by pitch descriptions. Um, I, I read them with a grain of salt. I don't try to follow those things too much. Um, I try to get the start of the route right and then sniff my way up and just cross check. <clears throat> so the way I would describe it is uh, you work your way up here into this corner and it's, there's a pretty obvious ramp going off to the right. And it's, it's just a nice class three ramp. Because of the, the rock is a little bit down slopey, it's, most people will want to repel it going down, but, but going up, it's pretty fine. Um, if you had people that were uncomfortable, you could always have the first leader just set a fixed line and quickly bring a rope and, and you know, continue on. Pitch one is uh, fourth class, unless you do a, like a little block at the beginning, which is like five, five easy, couple moves. Uh, you basically kind of just, I don't know if it's even 80 feet, you just kind of go up a little block or around a block and move left, and then you go up like kind of a chimney thing. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not super solid, it's also not horribly loose, it's, it's fine. Um, at that point, um, there's a, and, and all these pitches have, have established um, belay stations and rappel anchors. You can fortify them, you can verify, you know, check them, and Add a, add a add a sling and cut an old one away or whatever, but it's 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 traveled enough that there's something the whole way up. So you do one pitch there, fourth class, then you just move the belay. Uh, pitch two is 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 literally like class three. If if you're worried about someone in the party, the leader can just lead it and never put a piece and get to the next the next uh, belay anchor. Um, pitch three. And pitch four are the actual real pitches with a, a few class five moves. Uh, the clinky route description uh, freaked me out a little bit. Had, it's talking about like five hard above my pay grade, you know, go around this fourth class bypass. It, it wasn't bad. It was, it was literally like working your feet up a little bit and kind of making a move. Uh, five, five, six or something like that. Um, so those two pitches are um, typical kind of basic climb pitches where you have some fifth class moves in them. So that's uh, what I would call the second and third pitch. <clears throat> and then um, from that point, uh, it's kind of like loose, crappy rock. And I would recommend just um, uh, working as a group together close and just scramble up. Um, I did look for rappel anchors at the top and I didn't find anything that I would want to repel off of and also just the rope drag and having a rope going over loose stuff. Um, for this whole route, I mean, some of the pictures that I'm showing like completely melted out may make you think, oh, this is chossy, whatever. Really the only choss was, was, was this scramble up at the top. Um, and like I mentioned, we repelled everything down. So I think we did one, two, we did two repels and we moved to the next section and did one more, two more, something like that, four repels. So I would say uh, it's kind of like something in between the tooth and, and Thompson. Uh, Thompson's an intermediate climb, but it's an easy one. Um, it's more alpine nature the way Thompson is, um, but um, kind of in between is what, how I would characterize this. A very satisfying kind of day. Um, you're, it's an alpine environment. Um, 
there's no like obvious line, but like I said, there's, there's established uh, rappel stations. So if you know you're where someone has been before and the route finding was not hard. Um, so yeah, here's an example of uh, one of the obvious blaze stations. I mean, there's just a tree of a stout enough tree with a thick enough uh, trunk and pretty obvious uh, uh, slings have been set up there. Um, this was also from the summit route, uh, sorry, from the summit post uh, website. It's kind of funny because I almost took the exact same picture. I think this one's a little bit higher. I think that picture may have been down here. Um, as you get into this, what I call pitch two and three, and I think they call uh, three and four, uh, you actually start to get some really dramatic views going, to, looking down. If if this basin had snow in it, it would it would be a lot even more dramatic with a good contrast. And the views from the summit are are pretty spectacular. Uh, obviously, Bonanza is going to be like front and center in, in a lot of this, um, but just gorgeous 360 views. You have you have pretty good. Uh, prominence I don't remember the exact prominence here but um, you're you're on a peak that's by itself and it's far enough away from other peaks to get really nice views in all directions um, and, that, and that's me at the very top there I don't know what I'm doing looking at the summer register or something uh, but you can see that it's kind of it's a little bit nasty up here and I think Yes, that's Devor in the background. So that's the, the next thing I'll show. And these are the lakes I was mentioning with the nice flat area and you have to scramble up. You have to scramble up onto this, uh, one of these ramps in here and then go around the, just go up the ridge, go around. And then this is the snow field I was mentioning that was ice. I tried to go into one of these notches here and eventually gave up. I tried that one, I tried that one. I tried coming in from the angle. And eventually I just went around this little gendarme and then just scrambled on the, the back side there until I got up to into this area. On the back, it's a lot less dramatic terrain. It's just class three. Uh, this is uh, another Everett leader, Kashan. Okay, so I believe this is uh, DeVore now. I see here. Yes. Okay. So this is approaching Devor. Um, this is kind of that flat area that I was mentioning. Uh, I picked a drainage that kind of rounded a, a corner and, and you suddenly get this view. I suppose you could camp up here, but it would be hauling your packs up a lot of rugged terrain for uh, the only purpose would be a great, uh, great campsite, I think. Um, as you can see, this is pretty spectacular terrain. Uh, this is uh, Tupson, which looks impossible from this angle. And that, I mean, you literally climbed, this is that basin, <laughs> you literally went up this. Um, I think it's called White Goat or something, which is also something you could uh, combine with this. I couldn't find a very good route description for it, so I don't even know if it's class four or fifth class or what it is. Um, so I mentioned that the top of Tupson had um, some choss. This was the this was the most unsavory thing of the whole climb. Um, climbing this 100 feet of crappy stuff to get to the ridge uh, was pretty bad. And this is in September. Everything is is melted as it's going to get. Let's say so. Once you top get up to where I'm standing, and you look up ridge towards <coughs> Devore. That's what you see. You mostly just work up a little climber's trail that winds through here and avoids gendarmes up to that icy patch that I was mentioning, which is somewhere up in here, behind here somewhere. Uh, it's more of the trail. Uh, I think you can see like, I'm not sure where that rock is, if it's that one or that one. This is, this is getting close. That's the summit, one of those two. And the views just, they go on and on. You, you, every time you want to catch your breath, you just look at that. On the way down, you've got that in your face the whole time. It is just spectacular. 
<clears throat> um, this is the very final uh, section for Devor. <clears throat> You basically uh, just work your way around this climber's trail. It's pretty easy, class two, three. You can see the, my uh, climbing partner right there. You work your way over here, and here is that fourth class unprotectable section. So you want to bring a rope, um, at least for anybody that's uncomfortable. It doesn't make sense for more than one person to solo that anyway, and everyone would repel it. Um, and then you kind of work your way over here and there's one exposed fourth class corner, which was one move. Uh, we were comfortable doing it, so we just did it, but you might want to put a hand line there. And that's pretty much it for this one. It's basic Alpine for sure. Uh, I think that's it for these. Yep. So I'll just leave the beautiful view there. And uh, yeah, that, I, I would say if you're looking for something off the beaten path, if you've done a lot of uh, basic rock climbs, you've already done the Tooth Kangaroo Temple, South Early Winter Spires, Ingles, and you're looking for something different, uh, the season for this is, is probably uh, Memorial Day um, through the first uh, snows that stick in October. You just have to be mindful late season of the shorter days. Um, not, it's not crowded. There's no red tape. Uh, this is in the Glacier Peak Wilderness area. You don't need to get any permits. There's no, I guess it's a 12 person party size. I would recommend four people, two leaders and two followers. I wouldn't, because of the rocky section, I wouldn't um, put six people on a route. But if you came up here with eight people and four of them did tups in one day and Devore the other day, and then you swapped, that would work. So that's it for me. Wow, those were great photos. Thanks. That Thank looked you. really incredible. And let's do. All right, are people seeing my screen? Yeah. All right. Cool, and I got a little laser pointer as well. So check that out. Um, I'm talking about Mount Rexford. Um, Mount Rexford, um, the whole Nisakwatch um, Rexford Basin area. I've been up to twice. Um, I did the West Ridge when I was my very first year in intermediate. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Tess. I'm a climb leader um, with the Seattle branch of the Mountaineers. Um, and this was sort of one of the outings, um, you know, where I feel like I cut my teeth a little bit um, learning uh, about alpine climbing, um, and it was awesome. Um, it's a um, pretty strenuous approach, um, but the scrambling and the rock climbing um, is on really solid rock, um, and we had great weather, and um, yeah, it was just super fun. And then um, I took my boyfriend Michael back to the same area um, to go do uh, the Southwest Ridge on North and Sockwatch Peak, because um, there's a couple different peaks in the area that you can explore. Um, and I was almost reluctant to talk about it tonight because um, I've never really run into that many people um, up there. So fortunately, I think the approach uh, does keep some people away. So um, just for context, uh, Bellingham down here, go over the border, you hop on Highway 1 um, in Canada, and you get on Chilliwack Lake Road, do, 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 do. and then Rexford is up here, um, and at this Riverside Campground area is where the Nisakwatch 
Creek Forest Service Road um, comes in and this road is um, real rough. Um, I've read a couple trip reports where they only got in about this far on the road, which means they had like another two miles that they added um, to their drive. Um, I think we were able to get um, the most recent time we went in 2018 uh, to kind of where this little campsite is just before that. Um, and just to give you an idea um, of what I mean when I say rough, um, this is a little bit of an idea. Um, <clears throat> I think this picture actually was where we, it, things got a little bit too crazy and we realized we had taken um, a short spur, um, but the main road does look like that in a couple places. So um, you definitely want to take it slow and have a high clearance vehicle. Um, let's see here. Um, some of the older trip reports um, that you may read um, talk about this trail not being signed. Um, we were fortunate enough to, um, I think both times, the very first time I went, the sign was new and had just um, come in. Um, and, you know, it's kind of interesting because the road is pretty rough and things don't look like they're maintained and the trail is not maintained that well, but um, there is some okay signage um, to really reassure you that you're in the right place. Um, I'm actually just going to go back um, one slide here, hopefully. Uh, this is going to let me do that. Um, yeah, for some folks are more familiar with this area because Slessy Mountain um, is right across from where Rexford is, um, and Slussy has one of the classic climbs on there and is um, just a really stunning peak. So if you're wondering about that, um, just get you oriented a little bit there. Um, so obviously there's the road to deal with, um, and then there is this very steep trail. Um, and when I say steep, I mean 4,000 feet in two miles. And I remember um, the first time I did this, um, you know, we had planned on doing it as an overnight um, since we were coming all the way from Seattle. Figured you might as well stay the night, beautiful spot to camp. Um, we we're also new trad leaders and definitely brought like the kitchen sink with regard to rock gear. And I remember my pack feeling so heavy and it feeling as strenuous as climbing Rainier. Um, and then the second time I did it with Michael, I was actually feeling a little bit under the weather. So both times I've done this approach, it's been pretty brutal. Um, but uh, as soon as you get up there, you're like, wow. Uh, totally worth it. Um, when you're going up, um, the trail is pretty rugged, and but fortunately um, there is some flagging along the way to orient you. So um, yeah, just look for some orange and pink tagged along. You can see a little bit of that in the corner here. You can also see the giant tall step I'm about to do. Um, if you are recovering from any injuries and can't do big tall steps, um, this would not be the trail for you. Um, so as you're going up, there are a couple small creek crossings, um, which is something to keep in mind as far as uh, collecting water. Um, because it's such a steep approach, you know, you don't want to have a ton of excess water. Um, but at the same time, um, later in the season, uh, there isn't much water because the snow melts. And so um, keeping in mind where those crossings are um, for your way back down, if you were doing a day trip, um, is important. Um, I think the main one um, that we, that I had maybe used um, was about two and a half miles from where we ended up parking. But the big logistical thing 
um, is that you know you just have to be a little bit prepared to um, add some mileage um, because you might not end up parking um, this little track right here um, is not where we ended up parking we ended up parking you know further down the road um, and so you're um, I think most people's mileage for this outing um, ends up being about 10 miles round trip um, and you're looking at you know 5,000 plus elevation um, gain so <clears throat> The first time that I went um, was in August. Um, and honestly, I think end of July and beginning of August is really ideal for the West Ridge of Rexford um, because there's um, a fair bit of fourth, third and fourth class scrambly bits before the rock pitches um, and it'd be um, Really good to make sure that was all dried out. Um, however, um, the one thing that we noted, we went at the end of August and the couple snow patches that we used for melting water um, were pretty darn dirty. That was probably some of the ashiest water um, I've had to drink <laughs> in a while uh, that we were using at the end of the day after completing our climb and hanging out at camp. Um, the other thing to note is um, if you go earlier season, um, you'll probably encounter fewer folks, um, which I personally really like. And uh, but you will have snow, which means um, I think at uh, some point I ended up um, putting Michael just corrected me and said that it was not in June which is interesting because I could have sworn that it was June. He thinks it was the end of May. Um, regardless, lots of snow, um, and it was helpful having the uh, mountaineering boots with us because um, there was some sections up at the top um, where it was nice to feel more confident kicking steps. Um, if you also went pretty early season, you might consider bringing some lightweight crampons. Um, if it had been a colder cycle, um, it hadn't been that cold, so all the snow was pretty soft that we were encountering, um, but just something to keep in mind. Um, this was our camp um, early season. Um, so as you can see, this big boulder field, um, totally covered in snow. A lot of trip reports that you read about Mount Rexford, there's a big boulder. Um, and you'll see it on the next slide that I took from Steph Abegg um, that um, people camp on. Um, so, you know, this looked totally different um, the second time around than when I had been up in August, but just as beautiful. And um, the clouds kind of swirled around and um, as the sun set, things lifted. Um, and as you can see, the rock is just stunning. It's like mini little bugaboos, perfect granite. Um, I was really happy. The second time around, our packs were much lighter. Um, brought the lightweight tent set up. <laughs> um, was feeling pretty smug about that whole situation. Uh, this is what it looks like. Uh, this is what it looked like in August. Um, Obviously, Steph Abegg does this, these pictures and overlays really well. So I wasn't going to try and remake the wheel, and I will just give her lots and lots of credit. Um, so the basic route is this West Ridge um, green line on the right here. Um, but as you can see, there's tons of rock. There's multiple lines on South Nisakwatch. Um, there's kind of a link up that some people do with the North Ridge of North Nisakwatch over to the North Ridge of South Nisakwatch over to the North Face of Mount Rexford. Um, you'd probably want to wait a little bit later season. Um, there were some steep snowy bits there. Um, and in fact, when we did the Southwest Ridge early season, um, this 5-9 purple route over here, uh, we weren't quite able to do this normal descent um, due to the way the snow was kind of sitting up there. Um, 
So I had to do a couple improvised repels. Fortunately, um, yeah, so here's that boulder I was mentioning that a lot of people camp on. Um, there are a couple other flat spots, um, but it is heather. Um, so you've got to be really careful about your impact in the area. Um, I know that there had been folks up um, when we went who are on the boulder and so we ended up camping more on the heather and um, just trying to find an area that somebody else had used. Um, so things to things to consider. Um, let's see here. Get to next slide. Um, <clears throat> so actually we'll go back here on the right hand side um, you're scrambling up kind of the toe of this ridge do 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 um, if you try and cut up earlier um, you're going to end up with some steeper terrain that you probably don't want so do kind of go to the end and throughout um, this little scrambly area um, there are some short steps that feel kind of fourth fifth class um, bit and then there's some areas that feel really casual because you've got trees and shrubbery um, next to you um, to kind of you know uh, protect you and it feels less exposed um, but really fun scrambling everything feels super sturdy because um, it's just lots of big stuff um, this photo was stolen from Bill Ashby turns out I'm not very good at taking photos um, on trips and yeah to do so you yeah continue up um, the ridge um, and then you get to this part where it looks a little bit flatter um, which is where this picture was taken um, and so this is kind of cool you're like oh my gosh the peaks right there wow this is so amazing um, and you trot along and you drink some water um, and then your friend that you went with is like oh yeah that's not the real summit that's the false summit you're like oh okay well I hope it's not too far behind there and it's not um, but when you get down to the base and you kind of curve curve around over here um, uh, you get to a little bit of the fifth class climbing um, which you know again really pretty easy going lots of places to put your feet lots of places for gear um and really solid rock um so you do kind of two pitches and then you get up to this flat area um this photo again um bill ashby took um i have a very similar photo of my friend ellie sitting in the same spot um, bringing a follower up and then um when you're on this flat area um there's kind of an exposed step around uh, to the right. Um, you can see the final summit block, um, and this is a picture of that. Um, and there is this little chimney, which is like the one awkward five, 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 six move. Um, this guy's on repel um, coming back down, but um, it's just this kind of chimney move in the center here. Um, and then you know you're in the right place because there's this fun little Doug Rexford uh, memorial up here and um, you know enough room for a handful of folks to sit um, not particularly flat for hanging out but um, you end up with pretty awesome views of Mount Baker and Shuxon and Slessy um and then you descend and you're really just retracing your steps so you've got a couple repels um off the summit block um and then you're kind of traversing back and um i think we ended up um it, it started the clouds came in as we were descending and um, it started sprinkling and we ended up um, somewhere like around here um, finding 
an area to get down a little bit more and ended up doing like a double length rappel to just get us down onto the ground faster um, because we were a little bit worried about some of the down climbing scrambly stuff. Um, and, you know, clearly somebody else had done the exact same thing because there was um, some tat already up there. Um, so, yeah, overall, um, kind of final thoughts. Um, it's incredibly beautiful. This photo is pixelated, and um, but it is one that I took in the evening. You can see Slessy over here and Baker tucked in the back. Um, it's good rock. Um, the route finding was pretty straightforward um, for a new trad leader. Um, you definitely want to consider um, how much gear you're taking because um, it is a pretty strenuous uphill approach. Um, if I was going again and just doing Rexford, um, I'd probably just bring a handful of cams and a handful of nuts, uh, you know, and like 10 slings and call it good um, versus like the full double rack I think we brought last time. Um, as, as nervous Nellies. Um, we did want a more full rack though for the Southwest Ridge. Um, so another thing to consider when you're going up into this area is um, whether you want to combine a couple routes together. Um, so having some, uh, some of those routes might require um, a little bit of a bigger rack. Uh, yeah, and just being careful about um, the water um, bit. Don't end up like us late season drinking um, black snow, <laughs> essentially. Um, you know, go a little bit earlier in August um, and it'll be perfect. So, um, that concludes what I was going to talk about. Um, and I think um, Garrett and um, Sky were going to kind of help moderate some comments or questions that folks may have. Um, I'll go ahead and um, stop sharing my screen and then we can. Tess, um, can you actually keep sharing your screen? Oh, sure. Little questions photo <laughs> rather than us just putting up one that says Keep sure I wasn't sure if like people could see people's faces if we were going to do video a little bit easier um without that but that's fine yeah yeah mm -hmm. they, they they should be able to modify it on their end as yeah. far as who pops up and all that all right. okay um hi everyone so I'm Sky and I'm been planning all of these events, so I'm just going to kind of moderate the Q&A, but any of the presenters that you're asking a question will answer it for you. So first off, um, I'm going to put a link in the chat, and I'll send this out in an email tomorrow to everyone too, but the Mountaineers just published a really great blog on how to recreate responsibly right now, and because trails potentially are going to be opening up on May 5th, it's just something that if you're going to go hiking at all, please read it and just kind of pick up some tips on how to do that during this time. Um, so that's in there. I'll also send that out to everyone via email after the presentation. And if the presenters send me links to their slides, I can send that out as well, just so people have beta. So if anyone, if you have a question, I'm going to have you use the raise your hand feature and then I'll kind of call out people's names when I see that. And then once you're called, you can unmute and turn your video on to ask your question. All right, so if anyone has questions, go ahead and try to raise your hand. Not seeing any questions yet. You can also ask them in the chat too, if yeah. you don't want to raise your hand. Yeah. Such comprehensive instructions <laughs> for everybody. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Dan is asking, what peak is behind me? That's Prusik Peak. 
his favorite photo. <laughs> um, okay. Oh, red tape for Rexford. No permits. Yay. On no red tape. Um, yeah, it's pretty much um, mostly because it's not really maintained, right? So I think um, logistically, a lot of those campgrounds in the Chilliwack Lake area uh, do fill up pretty quickly. Um, so you might want to reserve that ahead of time um, if you are, you know, going to car camp. Um, there is camping, you know, you could camp uh, along the Forest Service Road in your car. Um, and there is that one little Slessy Memorial camp. Um, spot but I think that's all it's all just first come first serve um, type of stuff so that's uh, yeah nice it looks like uh, Jan we have a question for you um, about Baker and they're wondering if you've gone up any other routes on Baker Need to get on you. Yes, I've been up the the other routes, like uh, all the three other routes that I showed in my description. Uh, so Coleman, Easton, and the Northridge. And um, while Coleman and Easton are certainly standard, very busy routes, quite in contrast to uh, the Boulder route, which is the favorite. Depends on who you go with. <laughs> it's but only his favorite if like his car doesn't break down. Yeah, well, that's one thing. No, but if you want to go out with students and want to have them have their first glacier experience, probably Coleman and Easton are good ones. Uh, but if people are a little bit more advanced, basic students, uh, the Boulder route is certainly fun. They all have different qualities to them. Right. And Stephen, I think we have a question for you. What was the name of the lake looking you were looking at as you came down from Devor? Yeah, so I just checked uh, Caltopo. I don't see any name for the lake. It is the source of Bird Creek. Um, it was probably something like Lake 7505 or something. <laughs> Doesn't look like it has a name. I think the locals call it Bird Lakes, and I hate to chime in, but I lived in Steakin for a couple seasons, so um, that, that there makes, are, yeah, yeah a lot of folks sense. go up there just as kind of like a backpacking but scrambly destination, the lakes on their own, because um, it is pretty up there. And... Yeah, that's my question. Um, okay, one more question that I guess anyone can chime in on, but any favorite resources when looking for and then planning these less traveled basic climbs? Do you want to... It feels like a lot of word of mouth in moments like this is how I found out about less traveled routes, things like that. Um, yeah, that's my source. There's a lot of good trip reports on um, the Mountaineer site, but also, Northwest Hikers, you know, that whole forum thing and um, on Summit Post and Mountain Project and that kind of thing. Uh, Summit Post, Peak Bagger, uh, Sean Albert, Sushi. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Sushi's also really good with her, uh, her and like Ian Lauder with like the route pictures and putting. Uh, the overlays on it. Um, it's all, I mean, it depends on, some people like to know exactly what they're getting into versus a little bit more of a surprise. Um, and and step a bag. Yeah. Uh, yes. And the cool thing was sometimes I get on Steph's site and I'm like, oh my gosh, she does so many things. Like I'm not climbing at the 512 level. Um, but she has a ton of really neat northwest scrambly stuff um and some you know routes like this where she's done a harder route and an earlier and an easier route as well so um definitely don't rule rule that out awesome. and tess there's one for you how long did it take to drive to where you left your car 
Good question. I mean, the Forest Service Road is not long. Um, and you should Google map the other part. The Forest Service Road's only like five-ish miles or something like that. So um, I think we were able to, maybe only four. Um, so we were probably driving um, for about, I don't know, half an hour, 40 minutes on the road, which I guess sounds like a long time now when I'm saying it, but you know, it's all part of the adventure. Were there any uh, porcupine concerns, like in the bugaboos? No, I think that's more of like a Rockies thing, and we're still in fun Cascade territory. Yeah. I've seen them on several trips. We haven't seen them, but we definitely... I haven't seen them either, and I want to see them. My dog almost got in a fight with a porcupine on South Spectacle Butte. Oh. Wow. Where is South Spectacle Butte? It's near Maud. Okay, gotcha. Also on the West Craggy. Mm hmm Interesting. I have I have heard of more of them out by like the West Craggy Pasatan area. Um, okay, so Stephen, this will be for you for the Chelan trip. Are there any easy non technical scrambles nearby that you would recommend? Uh, so I also I that trip was a was a basic climb. It was supposed to be a five day trip, but um, Everybody else but me lost heart. We were supposed to do flora. <laughs> so I went up there separately, and that is a very nice non-technical scramble. That actually has a, a gorgeous campsite. You go all the way up. I think it's called 4th of July, of July. Basin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's gorgeous meadows. A little bit past Bird Creek Camp. But that's pretty far. I think McGregor Mountain would be one if you're, if you're willing to suck up, like, some uh, vertical gain in short, short elevation. Um, it's like three miles, but 5,000 feet. That's at the, at High Bridge. So you just take the red bus all the way to the end. Highly recommend McGregor if you're um, fit, but want something a little bit less technical. Awesome. Um, it looks like one other person is asking if there were any snakes encountered near Chelan. Nope. They're only, not on that side of the lake. They're only on the lakeshore side. Yeah. They're only at Royal Columns and Leavenworth. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yes, yeah, so a couple of people have asked if PowerPoints will be shared. Yeah, I will have the presenters send me links to them um, or like share versions of them. And then I won't be sending the email out to everyone until tomorrow once we have the recording of this and then we'll send that out as well. So, and I'll probably not include them in the email, but I will post links on the event page so that everything will be there for anyone to find. Um, okay, it looks like a couple more questions. What's the best time of year for McGregor? Later season, I would say. Um, if you, just because you'll be able to travel faster, um, there's like a bajillion switchbacks. So when those are melted out and then you can just kind of like cruise going up those, um, that's, and McGregor used to have a lookout on the top of it. Um, and there's like a repeater there for the whole park. And the reason it's up there is because it does have the best prominence um, in the area there, um, so. Cool, uh, another one for you Tess, other than Rexford, what were the other peaks you've done in that area? Oh, I've only done, like in that basin, um, I've just done North Nisakwatch, um, that Southwest Ridge route. Um, my boyfriend Michael and I have looked a little bit into doing Slessy, um, him in particular that's across the way. That has uh, some seasonal considerations because there's a glacier um, and things sort of have to wait for part of it to fall off each season in order to do what you want to do. Um, but I'm hoping to do a little bit more in that area. Um, and there's a bunch of cool stuff um, around Squamish uh, and like Whistler as well. Um, and I have not done um, Spickard and Redoubt. Um, Stephen, do you want to mention those a little bit? Yeah, there's quite a few great uh, climbs, you, you continue past on that Chilliwack 
Lake Road. I don't know if it's east or northeast without a topo in front of me, but um, gorgeous area with several options for scrambles or technical climbs. But Spicker and a readout are, are, are just awesome. All right, any last minute questions? All right, well, thank you everyone for joining us. And next week, um, still on Thursday, we're doing all of the Thursdays through May. Um, so next week, Gabe is gonna be presenting on um, some hard alpine climbs, including Liberty Crack. So tune in for that. Um, and then we'll have some other awesome presentations in May as well.